So without further delay, I have the privilege of introducing our keynote speaker who needs no introduction. Glenn Hubbard is the Russell Carson Professor of Finance and Economics and the Dean Emeritus of Columbia Business School. Glenn is a specialist in public economics, managerial information, incentive problems in corporate finance and financial markets and institutions, and the faculty director of the Jerome Chazen Institute here at Columbia. In addition to writing more than 100 articles on economics and finance, Glenn has published three books, textbooks, and many others. Uh, from 2001 to 2003, he was the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, sits on many boards. Uh, I could do a very long introduction. I'm going to keep it shorter. One thing I will say, though, off script, is I've heard Glenn do this market overview explaining what's going on many, many times, and I always look forward to hearing your remarks. I think they're insightful, particularly the, the more crazy the market is, the more I look forward to hearing your remarks. So Glenn, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, David, and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, welcome home, uh, basically. Uh, when David was referring to the incredible rich network that's used, that's you as a former dean, of course, I thought he said incredibly rich. My ears perked up, but you're, hopefully you're that too. Um, real estate, to my mind as a non-expert, is of course about location, location, location. And that's why you're here today. Uh, New York is a global capital not only of the ideas and money of real estate, but of global services businesses. Columbia Business School and the Milstein Center in particular play a big role and then all of you as a network, so, so thank you. I'm gonna do two things with you today and uh, take your questions as well, but uh, one that's the shorter part is kind of a short run of, of where we are, but I wanna talk about a very big question that I think will dominate discussions over the next decade of where we're going to be, not only for the economy as a whole, but in real estate uh, in particular. Uh, in thinking about where the world economy is now, I think it's fair to say many economists have been surprised at how robust the underlying real economy is, at least in the United States, a slower obviously uh, in the Eurozone, but robust in Japan uh, by that country's growth standards, and while China is slowing, still somewhat promising growth. At the same time, inflation is beginning to recede from, at least by recent years, scary levels. Although, as I'll comment later, it is not in the United States at 2%, nor is it going to be 2% anytime soon without action that remains fairly uh, restrictive uh, by, by monetary policy, obviously with effects for the economy uh, and, for, and for real estate. Will we have a recession? Honest answer, of course, I don't know. Uh, I think so, though. Uh, it's very hard to imagine the stance of policy this restrictive without at least a mild recession. That's an economy-wide statement. For real estate in particular, and I'll come back to this toward the end of my remarks, I expect the kind of recession to look for is more like the early 1990s, uh, not as much of a overall general crisis in the economy, but a restructuring and recapitalization of properties and, uh, and locations. Now, one of the things about the crazy upside down nature that David talked about with the economy is it changes, I think, the way that we as business people have to look at planning. As you know, most corporate plans in any industry uh, tend to follow some kind of expected value and the CEO lays that out to the board, and then the board and he or she agree on it and march on. I expect we're not seeing as much uh, of that right now, at least I hope not. We're going back to what would have been more common uh, when I was younger, which is old-fashioned scenario planning, meaning I may not know much about unconditional probabilities of various things happening, but I may know a lot about conditional probabilities, meaning if this happens, then this. I think more businesses are planning in that way for geopolitics, for financial markets, and as I'll come to in a few minutes, domestic uh, politics uh, as well. 
In that kind of environment, I think we're moving from a discussion in business rooms of so-called mastering cycles, you know, what is it that's moving the current business cycle, more to what I would like to think of as cycling masters. What are the big things that are coming our way? Those big things, I'll mention them in turn uh, today, uh, have to do with the economy and technology uh, and politics. Now, I want to start out with what I think is the big thing. Uh, and that is growth. There are two ways of thinking about this. One is um, Robert Lucas, who's the late Nobel Prize winner in economics, used to say it's not surprising that economists get caught focusing so much on economic growth, because once you start to think about it, you can't really think about anything else, in Lucas's words. And it's easy to see why, because small changes that are structural and long-lasting, be they good news or bad news, really spell our future in living standards. The other growth thinker is Willie Sutton, the bank robber, who said it's because it's where the money is. So if you're trying to figure out the future, it's really all about growth. Now, growth is all about something else to a first approximation, uh, and that's about productivity. It's not literally everything, but boy, it is almost everything particularly in a world where, at least in most uh, advanced economies, demographics are not favorable uh, tailwinds to growth. Now, for productivity as this, uh, as this big thing, if you looked at the United States in the post-World War II period, you see several sub-periods. Uh, and I say this uh, as an economist looking in a rearview mirror. People like me, or economists generally, tend to be pretty good at looking back and telling you about productivity turning points, we're not really so good uh, at calling them. Uh, Paul Krugman, Nobel laureate in economics, famously wrote a book called The Age of Diminished Expectations on the very eve of a productivity boom. And he's a very smart guy. So this, this is hard. But here are the periods. Post-war, the war to the early 1970s, really the golden age. When people wish we had an era of productivity growth, that's the period they're longing for. The second period, going from the 1970s through the 1980s, early 1990s, is a period of quite sluggish productivity growth and sluggish growth uh, in, in real wages uh, as a result. Early 90s, for at least a decade, is another productivity boom, the one Krugman uh, didn't forecast, and that boom came really from the ICT uh, revolution, completely changed um, business. We then go into a period of a structural productivity drop that starts in the early 2010s, and we are still in. What is changing, of course, is the advent of something new. When economists use words like something new, what they usually mean is an emerging general purpose technology, something that is revolutionary in and of itself and completely changes the growth prospects of industries and techniques around it. And that, of course, is um, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence and in particular, uh, generative uh, AI. Generative AI, I would argue, is both similar to and different from general purpose technologies that we know and love. It's similar, too, in that we're already seeing ways in which it's going to completely transform not just technology, but almost anything. Dare I say, even economics professors may get disrupted by this one. This is, this is very big. It, however, is different in a very important way, both economically in business, but also for politics. And it has to do with speed. Traditionally, general purpose technologies took a while to permeate through the economy. Bob Solow, a prominent economist, Nobel Prize winner, once famously said in the 1980s, you can see uh, IT gains in productivity everywhere except in the productivity statistics. And the reason for that is it takes a while for businesses, for organizations, typically to adapt to the new technology. The impact, for example, of an old technology, electrification on productivity, doesn't happen until the 1920s or 1930s. And I'm sure you know, that's not the dawn of electricity. It took a long time. Likewise, mainframe computing and the internet 
to other GPTs took a long time because the organization of the office, the organization of knowledge work took time. This is the sense in which the views of generative AI are that it's very different. The speed will be much faster. That means that the productivity gains may be much faster, but that means so too will be the dislocation. Let me try to use an example uh, to, set, uh, to set the idea. If I were to compare the number of days to get to 100 million users across recent technology platforms, it took Netflix 3,000 days to hit that mark. It took Twitter, X, Facebook, Spotify, all about 1,500 days to hit that mark. It took Instagram uh, 900, chat GPT, I wanna say an afternoon. I mean, it's not quite that fast, but it's a lot closer to that than any of the others. What's more important, of course, is not just the number of users, but the tremendous business use cases. If you look at studies that practitioners are doing of the likely potential cumulative growth effects, recent studies by McKinsey and Goldman Sachs have basically argued we could see a half a percentage point increase in productivity growth. That is absolutely huge with cumulative changes of between three and seven trillion dollars over a decade, depending on, the, depending on the model. Underneath that, and I wanna say this as a foreshadowing of something I'll come back to in the political economy of, of technology going forward, is the job market. So those statements about productivity growth are statements for the economy as a whole. And they're statements of potential growth if nothing tries to slow down the generative AI technology. But there are a couple of different effects and ways in which economists think about how AI affects labor. One is the classic effect, we go all the way back to Adam Smith, if I have a technological innovation, it's gonna raise productivity, it's gonna raise labor demand and raise wages. And that would be the good news story for AI. And it is certainly a plausible story. Uh, the wind in the sails of that story would be that AI does a lot in developing complementary technologies. Let's say I have a relatively low skilled job in retail or low end of services, it still may help me be more productive in dealing with customers. At the very high end, it might help me as a junior architect, uh, or a lawyer, or a banker, or dare I say, real estate professional or economist do his or her job. Those are all good stories. Eric Brynjolfsson at Stanford is probably the leading um, uh, arguer of those very positive stories. Of course, it is possible that AI does something else. The origins of thinking about AI are actually old. They go back to work in at least the 1950s by Herbert Simon and others, and the goal of the original discussions of artificial intelligence was nothing like I just described. It was actually quite different. It was to substitute for human general intelligence. One of the fears about AI and jobs, which has attracted interest of politicians as well as business people, is is it gonna be the case that this good news story that I led with happens Productivity, labor demand, wages, everything's going up, or is it, is it something darker? On that side, another very prominent economist, Daron Asimoglu, uh, sits. I would argue with you that the limits on growth from new technologies over the next decade don't come from the familiar places. And the familiar places to look for a problem are two. One is hiccups in the science that we're not gonna get it right. I am not uh, an engineer, well, actually I am an engineer, but of so long ago, it's, my views are irrelevant. But science is not going to be the problem here. Everyone I speak to who uh, is actually current here believes that the, the best things are still ahead. Nor do I think organizations are gonna fail to be nimble in capturing and using AI the way they might have been in some of the slower moving general purpose technologies of days gone by, I'm really worried about two things. One is some under the hood economic forces that I'll mention, uh, and the other is old fashioned 
politics, political economy, and I'll go over each of those, um, each of those in turn. One factor that can act to slow uh, change in technology uh, basically is a factor familiar, especially in a room like this, which are shifts in capital markets and interest rates. The 12 years of global low interest rates that probably dominate the careers of many people in this room uh, abruptly ended in 2022 and moved toward what I think of, at least by the standards of the recent past, as a new monetary order. I think, I believe that the Federal Reserve intends to deliver uh, a 2% inflation target. Inflation is not going to settle at 2% without high rates for a while. So I would say, and of course, you can discount this because I'm not the one playing with real money, but I would say to folks on Wall Street who are expecting rate cuts anytime soon, keep expecting, because it's not going to happen anytime soon. It will happen, of course, but policy would have to remain restrictive to get to 2%. Now, if your view is that the Fed doesn't mean that and is willing to accept the high twos or the low threes instead, well, that's a different argument, but I actually don't think uh, that is true. And even if it were true, it wouldn't affect as much predictions for nominal interest rates, because it would still mean uh, the inflation premium would be high. Obviously, in that new monetary order uh, headwind for technology, uh, the rate effect uh, is, is significant. If you think about technology investments and valuations, those, like real estate, are the um, long-dated cash flow assets. And if you, you know, walk into a room full of MBA students and say the real interest rates changed in one direction or another, the price of what kind of asset moves the most the fast, it's always an asset with a long life. And so the new monetary order is definitely going to be uh, a partial headwind. Where I think it's going to be a plus, though, is dynamism with the new technology. One of the downsides of the ultra-low interest rate environment may well have been a misallocation of capital. That will not happen with interest rates at more conventional levels. A second uh, headwind to worry about in the evolution uh, of the technology is really a potential new era of fiscal constraints. Now, on the one hand, you might say, well, what's he smoking? I mean, what's the fiscal constraint? Well, we have one political party in the United States says we won't raise taxes at all. Another party says we won't cut spending at all. The two parties are roughly 50-50 uh, in the Congress. And so what's going to happen? Well, I think what's going to happen is math. And so if one accepts the prospect that defense spending needs to rise, that spending on things complementary to this new technology boom, i.e. basic and applied research and support for adaptation to the policy need to rise, in the presence of already structural deficits, we may well have some fiscal, fiscal headwinds. We're already seeing as a result of current fiscal policy and the path that we're choosing to run, higher rates, uh, interest rates, the effects of that on the federal budget. This is the first year in which uh, interest spending actually exceeds national defense, which ought to scare everyone, uh, everyone in this room. Uh, and we're beginning to, in the political process, over-focus on things that aren't important, like little tiny elements of discretionary spending or saying, let's tax two or three billionaires, as opposed to more fundamental reform. That failure to act can disrupt the technological innovation, both through pricing and valuation, but all through, also through enormous uncertainty uh, about, uh, about business investment. The next factor I'd at least like to highlight or mention to you is about geopolitical, and then importantly, because we can control it more, domestic um, political dysfunction. In geopolitics, uh, a big win is oil and energy. Uh, I happen to sit on the board of Total, which is a very large uh, integrated oil company, and every discussion at Total is very much centered on what is the next 10 or 20 years going to look like 
for the pricing or production of oil with the geopolitical consequences. We're at a turning point where we're wondering as a society, not just about the price vector for oil, but the use of oil in a fuel mix. So the amount of geopolitical uncertainty from oil is probably unprecedented. The second that relates to geopolitics as opposed to events at home are defense and fiscal strains, as I mentioned. Uh, people who focus on the defense budget have argued we probably need to spend, at least in this country, about a full percentage point of GDP more on defense than we do today. There's absolutely no room in the budget environment to do that, raising big questions for business and growth about, well, is that gonna be financed by tax increases on, say, capital, or is it going to be financed by some other spending cut? Another possibility in this environment, of course, is an increase in the equity risk premium. So for a while, we had a period in which not only were safe interest rates very, very low, but the implied equity risk premium was also very low, and hence the value of equities very high. Now we're already seeing the unwinding of the safe discount factor, but we're also starting to see increases in equity risk premium with valuation effects. A lot of that is coming from this geopolitical uncertainty. For domestic politics, I think we have at least as large uh, a problem. Part of that is the fiscal one that I mentioned, the inability to address or deal with basically full employment deficits. We have an economy that's roughly growing at potential, even though it's slowing, yet we have enormous budget deficits of $2 trillion. But I would argue that the bigger effect and where it's gonna intersect directly with AI and growth over the next decade is through pressures on social stability. Think about technology and technological change over the past several decades. If you were to start your mind's eye in the early 1970s, and remember I suggested that was a period in which the halcyon productivity days were ending, we did start to see in the 1970s the emergence of very significant technological change affecting industry and also an effect of globalization. For most people in the news media or in politics, globalization trade, that's the big story. That's not how economists see it. Economists see technological advance as the big story. Globalization is a factor, but it is not the biggest factor. But over the period of time from the 1970s to today, we've basically seen a slow motion disruption. When I mention growth, imagine that I could describe to you, I have a coin, and of course coins have two sides, and the head side of the coin is growth, the thing we wanna talk about. The tail side is disruption. The truth is there is no modern economic model of growth that isn't centered on disruption. No economist believes that growth happens by just simple gradual progress. It's jerky, discrete changes in possibilities like generative AI, but that bring with them disruption. Now, if you go to the political economy of change, much, change, much of what we've seen in the rise of populism in industrial economies has been a reaction. Chances are, and I can tell by looking at you that econ was your favorite subject in college, you, you have that look, and, and I'm sure you remember in Econ 101, which I'm sure was your favorite course, um, the professor talked about technological change benefiting the economy on average. He or she probably told you that free trade or globalization benefited the economy on average. Then you probably went back to sleep or you know, looked at your phone or something. And then he or she probably also told you, but not everybody, right? There's gonna be distributional consequences. Some people, like all of us, really won big in that average refloating of the boats from technological advance and globalization. Others did not. The failure of our political process to really deal with that fundamental Ecom 101 question has left smoldering sectors uh, in the economy. And that was with technological advances that were slow motion changes over decades. As I argued with you before, one of the key things about AI that's different or at least expected to be different, is how quickly it is going to change things. This could well be the mother of all 
political economy problems. What to do? Well, let me first mention it in econ speak, and then mention it as if one were talking to somebody who uh, was a doer in politics. So if you think about it in econ speak, for God's sakes, we need the golden goose. So we need to support innovation. So for an economy like this, that would mean massive support for basic research. Your favorite course, Econ 101, professor probably told you we're not gonna get enough basic research if we wait for business people to do that because they can't appropriate all its value. We could be doing a lot to support basic and applied research. We could be doing a lot to boost investment. We could try to raise national saving by getting our fiscal house in order. And importantly, for the political economy of the situation, we need to encourage participation of more Americans uh, in the life uh, of our economy. In terms of the way one might uh, speak politically about it, I don't know about you, but I don't much like words like America first, but how about America the best? How about an economy that devotes the resources to be at the frontier? Instead of eat the rich, which doesn't sound so good to me, uh, how about restoring the American dream and opportunity? And instead of um, words about industrial policy from various bureaucrats, how about thinking about a can-do and let rip economy with technology? For business leaders, this is going back to the future. It's really going back to scenario planning, it's adding a twist of thinking about the social support for business that we all took for granted and may not be there, and staying focused on that high productivity and high growth future. For real estate, even if you, obviously these, the current headwinds are obvious to everyone in this room, there's also a lot of opportunity in the redesign of housing, of logistics, of healthcare, with complementary skill investments in AI, with a reorganization of the office, the complicated part will be on the financial side of this, how one works through a period in which the existing capital stock of real estate may have been partly in the wrong place and partly overvalued. Working through that to the, to the new world is actually an interesting challenge, one for the private sector, but also for the public sector. Uh, part of it is, and David and I were speaking about this before we started, do you want a slow change? Because the private sector will get this done. Or do you want a faster change, maybe with more public sector involvement? There's not a right or wrong answer, but I think you're gonna be talking about it today. So let me stop there and thank you, but I did want to allow some time to take uh, any, any questions you have. I think you have smarter panels than me coming, you're probably gonna answer them, but I'll do my best if you have a question. Yeah, I, don't know if, I think there's a mic coming. That, Good morning. Uh, you mentioned um, kind of the prospects at one point uh, for the um, energy industry, oil and gas, kind of near term and long term. I, I'm curious what your particular view is or what you advise your, your clients on with regard to, you said you work with Total. Uh, what do you see as uh, the kind of near term two to three year future for energy business and then really for the longer term, say 15 years out? Well, it's a great question, and Total is very different. So if you look at the oil super majors, without oversimplifying, Chevron and Exxon live on a different planet than Total. And they may be right, they may be wrong, it's very different. Uh, Chevron and Exxon have essentially doubled down on a virtually complete oil and gas future, maybe not forever, but for as long as cash flows have meaning given discounting. Total's view, partly for being French, you know, it's in Europe, but partly from a different view about the markets, is you need a strong oil and gas sector with investment for decades, but at the same time, we should be growing much faster in alternatives. So we have just a very different CapEx profile and very different business plan. In the near term, from about two or three years, essentially all the super majors will rise and fall with the world price of oil. But over the longer term, you're gonna see big differences. You know, obviously Exxon and Chevron have both put their money where their mouth is recently on big conventional acquisitions. And again, time will tell if that's the right, the right answer. Yeah. Is, is there any world in which the Fed has to consider housing policy as the third latest school? I mean, 
Well, let me step back. That's a great question. Part of the trouble for monetary policy is it works through a few channels and mainly those channels. So really it works principally through interest sensitive spending, which is mainly durable goods, uh, housing and other durable consumption assets. And in an economy that's increasingly dominated by services, it's really hard for the Fed to engineer the changes it wants to, even going up or down, because its old interest-sensitive levers aren't as powerful as it used to be. I'm sure the Fed's paying attention to the housing market as it does everything else, but it's not the Fed's mandate. It is, however, Congress's concern. Uh, and I would say that one issue, of course, is in the US, we believe we have a God-given right to 30-year mortgages that can be prepaid. They're not orthogonal to your question uh, either, because you know you do have you know a lot of people sitting on three percent mortgages that say no, thank you, I'd, I'd, I'd not like to exit that transaction. So a lot this is very complicated, but I don't expect the Fed to put housing ahead of its inflation target. If that's the if that's a question, Congress though maybe. Yeah. Um, the questions, but one just to follow on. Do you have any comment about Do you have any comment about Freddie? or Fannie and the GSEs and their status and whether they could be used to further housing policy. And then uh, another DC question, just I think you were affiliated with the Bush administration and you're in DC quite a bit. Um, and given your comments about AI and how fast it's moving, the, the 2024 election must be very important to how AI is handled in the country. Do you have any comments on the outlook for that election or whether there's a good or a bad outcome as it relates to AI and how the country deals with it? I can think of multiple bad outcomes in the 2024 <laughs> election for AI. I, I don't think the likely candidates are probably deep thinkers in, in, in AI. I mean, I, I think a, a question that might be easier to answer is whoever gets to be our next president, will he or she think about a different organization to deal with that? I mean, Having sat in the White House, if you were thinking about, um, let's say, a financial crisis, it's easy to imagine the players you bring together quickly to advise the president on that. Something that's uh, structural like AI, I don't know, is that the Treasury Secretary's job? Is that the Labor Secretary's job? Is it the Commerce Secretary's job? I mean, we don't have a process to think about that. And that really, really worries me, whoever uh, whoever becomes president. And your first part was something else. Freddie and Fannie, I'll tell you a story. I must have been on the job at CEA for two weeks. And I gave a speech in Washington where I said, I like Freddie and Fannie so much, I wish there were more of them. I hadn't even gotten back to the White House before the chief of staff said, keep, keep that up and you're gonna get fired. Um, you can't do that, they're too popular. Uh, so that sort of says my views. To me, we need a coherent <clears throat> housing policy that's not dependent on an institution. As you know, around the world, there are other models uh, of dealing with this. You don't necessarily need, need Freddie uh, and Fannie to do it, at least as single companies. But that's just one person's view. Uh, yeah, well, here, we'll do one over here and then over here. Yeah. A uh, few things that you said. Uh, you thought there's likely to be a recession, potentially. Uh, rates will remain higher. Um, you know, what is your view on if there is a recession, what gets us out of that recession, assuming we ha it's caused by you know, high interest rates and the inability to, s to spend? Um, is, it, is it generative AI? Is it, is it something else? Like what, what is the catalyst for growth uh, if we enter a recession? Well, I think technology is going to be an important part of it, but I don't expect the recession to be very deep. You know, in an economy like we live in, it's highly services. If you want to get a deep recession, you'd have to imagine something exogenous like a financial crisis, an asteroid hits us, a geopolitical event, something like that. So I don't think we're talking about um, you know, pulling ourselves out of another 2008 
So in that sense, I don't think it takes very much to, to right the ship. And obviously, once a recession is underway, you will start to see short-term rate cuts. But I think the policy itself is still going to be restrictive for maybe longer than markets would like. Uh, it was one over here. Yeah. The, the debt levels in the US are massive and growing. When does it stop, if at all? Well, the word credit has a Latin root, credo, and that means I believe. And so that's what credit is. It is extended until it's not, until the belief is gone. Uh, right now, I think most people in the political classes could look at economists and say, why are you guys wringing your hands so much? I mean, at least until recently, the cost of debt was very low. Uh, in the United States, States, and even today, by historical standards, it's hardly off the charts high. That said, I think the way I think about high levels of debt, if you mean by that the public debt, is not so much that it's going to raise interest rates that much. We have a global capital market. That's probably not going to happen. But it does mean one or both of two things, that tax burdens have to go up in the future. And business people, all of us as households, we figure that out today and adjust or that we're gonna to have to start cutting spending on something. I mean, that's just math. There is no door number three, inflation, but that's just a tax. So I, I think that the public is starting to wake up, but still very, very slowly. If somebody were to ask me, is, are we gonna talk about debt in the 2024 campaign? I'd say absolutely not. I'd be stunned to hear it, hear it mentioned. So far, to my knowledge, we've had only one candidate in all the debates even mentioned. Is that the cane? Okay, thank you for having me. Bye-bye.